Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm going to try to buzz through um, several very important topics today in the video I'm making for you. Um, I'm going to review how to make a, a first sound on the head joint, and then we're going to try to talk about tonguing, intonation, and vibrato really quick. Um, so uh, you may remember um, a video I had you guys look at earlier. Mr. Selfridge um, showed how to make an initial sound on the instrument. There he is in the bottom right, uh, using only the head joint. I'm going to review um, the types of sounds you can make on the head joint and creative things you can do with that in uh, first few classes with a student. And when I begin a young private student, um, we spend the first two or three lessons only making sounds on the head joint. The students are sometimes a little impatient with that, but it's important um, that they uh, get, um, that can make a, a pretty decent sound with only the head joint. It's easier to hold a balance before we start putting the, the whole instrument together. Um, so you can make a variety of different sounds even more than Mr. Selfridge showed in his video. And I'm gonna demonstrate the things you can do um, uh, with the head joint only. So um, there's a low sound we can make with the head joint. And for young students, sometimes it's better if they hold the, the head joint here rather than on the end. It gets, there's a little more stable if they hold it in the center and place it on the chin below the bottom lip. Um, make this adjust that better. Okay. Um, and if we cover, which I recommend that you cover the um, end of the head joint and make a low sound. This sound is a little easier to make and a little more pleasing. Right? The a low pitch. That's somewhere around an A. Um, and it just takes slow, gentle air to make this sound. And Dr. Selfridge and many people teach um, bringing the lips together, um, firming the corners or ends of the embouchure, which I agree with. There's a little firmness here, uh, but the center is loose, but the lips are together. If you make the sound P, um, this makes the aperture really small. Now we don't articulate all our notes with the sound P. That's important to understand that this is something we do initially to get the aperture small enough. When we teach students, we make uh, a little uh, pop with a P to open the lips and get a small uh, slit in the hole. Then later we teach tonguing and begin with the lips slightly open. The many beginners and many doublers that come to the flute make too large of a hole like that and uh, don't get any sound. So if you make um, a P initiation, and blow across the hole, you get this low sound. You can also make a high sound. You can also make a slide whistle, which is a lot of fun. Students enjoy that one a lot. Um, you can also make pops with the head joint. If you hit the tone hole against your hand, makes a nice pop. You can also hit the head joint, the end of the head joint on your hand. That makes a sound. With young students, they can get creative and make up a little song with all these sounds. So I typically do some echo games with the class when I teach flute techniques live. And if I teach a beginning student, we do things like this. And you would copy that back. And then I might go. And then I might do something like. You would play that back. And then. Some people need to use their pinky to do the slide whistle if you have really thick fingers and can't fit your um, finger all the way in, but that's a lot of fun. You can even play. That's uh, not high enough <laughs> for the high note. Um, you can play little nursery tunes in that way with your finger. So that is uh, starting with sounds on the head joint. And then I wanna show you a fun little thing. Um, and I just wanna mention that some people can make a sound right away on the head joint the first day and they're off and running and that's great. 
I have never met anybody that couldn't produce a sound on the flute after a few weeks of, of work. Sometimes I have a student that it takes three weeks before they are consistent with getting this aperture and embouchure shape correct and making a sound. In my flute te techniques class, some students are still producing mostly air noise at the end of the three weeks when we work together, uh, but you can still hear the pitches in that sound. Um, but it's perfectly fine to have a very airy sound or mostly air the first few weeks and keep developing the aperture um, to make a sound. Now, something you can do that's fun is make a little mini flute out of just two parts of the flute. I have the head joint here and the foot joint only, not the body, I've left that in the case. You have to be careful here um, with little children, not have them drop it, but you can insert the head joint or the foot joint onto the end of the head joint very gently. Um, this can fall off. You want to be careful with it and have one hand here supporting the foot joint. The other hand brings the head joint up to your chin and you can play little tunes. So I'm putting my fingers on the big, uh, uh, the big round keys here when I play. And this is a B foot joint. It's a little bit longer than students would, would not have this last key here on a student flute. Um, when we use the foot joint on a regular flute, we are never touching these keys. Our pinky is operating these keys from here. But for the purposes of making a mini flute with a beginner, if a student's doing well, um, they can put this up and play little tunes on a mini flute like that. Be very, very careful. But that's sort of fun way to not have to balance the entire flute, especially with a small child for a week or so. Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to move out of this um, and see if there's anything else I wanted to show you here. That's it. I think we'll go on. Uh, let me look at my next slide. Is it about articulation? Um, no, I'm going to skip this one and come back. I'm going to go. Here we go and talk about tonguing because um, Dr. Selfridge and myself, um, we were starting um, initiating the sound with the letter P. And this is the way I was taught and many people teach and it really does work to make a small aperture, but you have to get away from that after a couple of weeks, once a student is producing a good sound, you tell them don't start with your lips closed. You want to start with the lips slightly open and say um, the syllable two, two, just the way you say my name, Tammy, or today. Um, and that is how we tongue on the flute. So if you could say after me, two, 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 and then without vocalizing, that's what we're doing on the flute. So then you would go back to your head joint games using a two, and make up some head joint rhythms that way. Now I recommend um, using the syllable two. It's a little stronger and clearer attack for the flute. Um, some teachers advocate the syllable do, 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 and I think that's okay for a more gentle legato tongue or for someone whose tonguing sounds too harsh. But for beginners, I usually use two to uh, the letter T. In American English, that is the clearest. Um, the illustration that I have here is uh, <laughs> not very pretty. This is from Jennifer Clough's website, the Canadian flutist whose materials I, I like. Um, but it does show that the red here is your tongue and the tip of the tongue up at the roof of the mouth behind your upper teeth. That is the typical position for articulation um, for American speakers when they say two. Um, Europeans sometimes place the tongue a little more centrally in between at the bottom of the uh, top teeth or in between the teeth when they say two. So French speakers uh, use the tongue a little bit more forward and they have a very clear articulation. And then I want you to know that Suzuki, uh, the Suzuki method, which is popular in several areas of the United States, um, there's a big Suzuki school in Tennessee, not that far from us. And, and throughout the Midwest, there are some Suzuki schools. They teach young students to um, teach the two tongue um, with the tongue between the lips. So the tongue is actually protruding through the aperture. 
and pulling back. And they actually teach young beginners to put a little grain of rice on the tip of the tongue and spit that grain of rice. Um, so you may meet someone trained in the Suzuki method as a young child that is tonguing and you see the uh, tip of the tongue protruding through the lips a lot. This makes a really clear sound and is useful sometimes. But as we get into faster tonguing and tonguing scales, we don't want to be doing this. This is a fuzzy video. I hope you can see this. Way too much tongue sticking out of the aperture there. So you want to uh, teach a student to pull the tongue back inside the mouth and be touching the, the teeth or the roof of the mouth just behind the teeth. That's Suzuki method of tonguing uh, between the lips. Uh, but in the United States in typical band programs, you want to teach students uh, to tongue however they say the letter T and the word two. Okay, um, great. I think that's everything about tonguing. I'm going to go back up to this slide that I missed here. Yeah, I want to show you uh, this illustration of uh, tone hole coverage. This is a little bit fuzzy illustration also from Jennifer Clough, Canadian flutist. And she shows how your embouchure changes uh, between registers. If you're playing low notes on the flute, which is on the left here, um, uh, medium range notes here or high range notes, that what we do use my head joint here, is um, for low notes, we do not cover much of the embouchure hole. My finger will pretend like that's my bottom lip. Um, for low notes, only maybe about a third of the embouchure hole is covered. And as we blow higher notes, that bottom lip comes forward. Um, and that helps a lot with register changes. If you're playing an octave, low B flat, Let me make myself bigger, see if you can see this. And I have another video that I'm going to have you watch that demonstrates this really well. Here's a low B flat and a high B flat. Right? And this is even more exaggerated. If I play a double octave, I'll do this on an A. It's a little bit fuzzy there and small, but you can see that the lips are coming forward more. Um, I'll have you look at another video later in this assignment that will demonstrate that really well. But this illustration here shows the difference in coverage level between the registers. And this will help some students having trouble getting high notes, do sometimes have students that are better at high notes than low notes. They need to slow down their airspeed in order to get the, the low register. Um, but there's definitely a difference in a flexibility of the lips that's needed as students advance to playing throughout the range of the instrument. Okay, um, next we're going to talk about intonation. Fun. And um, I put this chart up here as a nice generalization of intonation tendencies. Once someone is a little advanced and been playing several years, um, this chart does illustrate typical intonation tendencies for most flute players. Um, although it's fuzzy, you can see that in the low range of our instrument, at the bottom of the treble clef staff, these notes are all blue. Um, these notes tend to be flat. And many flute players, we need to um, loosen, not cover the hole too much, and angle the air up a little bit and check the pitch on those notes and not be flat. We're pretty good and stable. Um, elsewhere at the bottom of the staff. We've got a problem note, especially around C and C sharp. Those notes are very sharp for us because they we don't have many fingers down. They're a short tube note. That's common on uh, many of the woodwinds. When you don't have many fingers down, the the you can blow the note easily out of tune, bend it anywhere really, but they tend to be sharp. Then we're okay for a while um, until we get into the high register and you see a lot of sharp up here. We've got a couple random notes that tend to be flat, this the high, high B flat here. But most of the notes in the high register tend to be sharp on the flute, um, and we need to cover that hole more. We need to put uh, the bottom lip onto the hole more to get a good sound in the third register and get those notes not to be sharp up top. Uh, there are also some uh, special fingerings we can use. If a young student is playing very out of tune in a band or wind ensemble you are working with, you need to check the position of the cork in the head joint, which we talked about how to do that first. Make sure that's correct. Um, then you need to adjust the head joint position. Let me get my other flute here. Um, the head joint should never be all the way in. It should be pulled out. Let's see. Can you see? I don't think you can. I have a line 
this is too fuzzy. I have a line on my um, head joint and it's about, it's about right here. So I am pulled out about a half an inch. That's where I normally play because I blow a lot into the flute. Uh, for some students, it's about quarter inch. You need to pull the head joint out about a quarter. There's a quarter inch to a half an inch. Um, and if you're having to pull the head joint way out, more than half an inch to get in tune, something's wrong with the way the student is playing or, or with the cork. Um, so the head joint needs to be in the right position, but you know that a smaller instrument is higher if you think about the piccolo and a longer instrument like a bass flute or a trombone or a bassoon uh, is lower. So if we need, if a flute uh, player is playing too flat, we push the head joint in and make the instrument shorter. If a flute player is playing too sharp, we pull the, the head joint out a little bit and check the tuner again to make the instrument longer and lower the pitch. Um, you also need to adjust that tone hole coverage. The more we cover, uh, we can make the pitch flatter. And the more we uncover with the bottom lip, we make the pitch sharper. And I'd like to demonstrate that for you just do that on the head joint. Um, I'm going to start pretty uncovered. I made myself bigger here. Sorry, this seems to be fuzzy in this. I'm using a new program today called Loom. Uncover, uncover. So I'm really pushing my lips forward, lowering my head a little bit. I'll do this on a note on a regular flute. Flute. So you will see that when I open up and remove the um, the bottom lip from the tone hole, I get sharper. And as I push the bottom lip onto the tone hole, lower my head and cover more, I get flatter. So that is something that helps intonation as well. And that good players learn to adjust in a nuanced way uh, for intonation control. And that's something you can suggest to a young student. That control is hard to develop. Um, but you can make adjustments with the angle of the head joint. And you can also tell the student blow up a little bit towards the ceiling or blow more down into the instrument to make adjustments and help them with intonation. Okay, um, I think it's time to go to the next slide here. Okay, yeah, this is a fun one. Something important I want you to know. Um, the flutes are problems in wind ensemble sometimes. Um, when an entire wind ensemble of young players is playing, the flutes have an opposite tendency of reeds. It's very important for you to understand as a band director. During a diminuendo, if you ask your entire uh, woodwind section to play softer, 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 the flutes are going to go flat and the reeds are going to go sharp and they're going to become out of tune with each other. Uh, during a crescendo, Flutes are going to go sharp, whereas reed instruments tend to go flat. Now we work towards developing control and uh, controlling that, but many students even at the high school level and early college level don't have this kind of control. So I'm going to show you a diminuendo on a note and you'll hear the pitch change. I'm not going to make any adjustments with my lips. <laughs> Do you hear the pitch going down? Right? I have to work really hard to control that. by adjusting the air angle and my lips. Now I'm gonna make a crescendo on a note. Without having any control, that note goes very, very sharp. That's what students are gonna do. Um, in order to control that, I need to cover more of the whole as I crescendo. That was a little more steady. Okay, so with with student players, you're going to have this tendency that's opposite of the reeds and the wind ensemble is going to sound terrible uh, when they do a diminuendo together or a crescendo together. Or they're playing loud and they suddenly play soft. The flutes are going to be flat and your clarinets are going to be sharp. So you need to tell the flute players, blow up towards the ceiling, angle the air up, loosen and um, uh, open the embouchure hole a little bit and practice this with a tuner, uh, develop that control and make that better. So that's a particular problem with intonation. And it's really a problem even with professionals in, or in, in orchestras, um, this uh, tendency to be different. Okay, head joint sounds, tonguing, intonation. Yeah, I think that's everything. Um, I'm just gonna, 
say a word about vibrato here. I don't have a slide about it, but I'm just going to tell you that vibrato on the flute is produced uh, with pulses of air. Um, sometimes doublers come to the flute from a reed instrument or a brass instrument and they produce vibrato in different ways. Um, it's possible to make vibrato the way some jazz saxophonists do by moving the, the jaw or the lip. <laughs> You can see the end of the flute moving a little. I'm moving my jaw here. This is the way um, some jazz saxophonists produce vibrato is by abiding and releasing on the reed. And some brass players, um, trombonists and trumpet players, do use jaw or lip vibrato. Um, this is possible on the flute. And for a doubler who just plays the flute occasionally, I would say it's okay. Um, but someone who's going to play the flute a lot, it's really not the most effective way to, to have vibrato and control control it. Um, it's also possible to shake the flute with your hands. <laughs> and I've seen some doublers do that to produce vibrato, like in a pit orchestra or something. But the way uh, we produce vibrato is the same way that singers do, and is the same way most other orchestral woodwinds do, is with pulses of air. I teach vibrato um, with strong pulses of air from the abdominal muscle area. Um, and there's a change of pitch and a change of volume. And then as we develop vibrato and speed it up, that vibrato control rises in the body and really happens here in the throat and the voice box area. And we do it the same way singers do. So I teach it like this. <laughs> Right. If you, I tell students to hiss like a snake, they can do that. They do the same thing when they're playing a note on the flute. We do exercises where we speed that up. We do two per second, three per second, four per second, five per second. As the vibrato increases in speed, it naturally rises in the body and the students figure out how to do this the way vocalists do um, from the voice box and throat area. So that's how vibrato is produced on the flute. And that should happen after playing two years. Um, that can sometimes happen around eighth grade in an advanced player, ninth grade, 10th grade, um, late middle school, early high school students can learn vibrato. Okay, I got some fun here a little bit. Um, a few more slides that just show, uh, um, Poor posture and problems. We're just going to review a little bit. These are just funny. There are lots of stock photos um, you can search for on Google of um, bad a bad position uh, with people holding flutes. I think this first one is hilarious. Wait, I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. Um, this young lady is has the hands reversed. <laughs> Her right hand is closer to her body, so she should be holding. She switched them, and she's trying to hold the flute like this, and the hands are just not in the right place. That's hilarious, I think. Um, next slide here. Um, this young man, <laughs> doesn't he look great? He's got the flute backwards. It is the wrong way. The wrong keys are showing forward. These are thumb keys that you see at the front. So he's just completely not able to play, um, and that's pretty funny. This young lady is cute. She um, is also holding the flute the wrong way with the thumb keys forward. Um, this pinky key here for the left hand is what should be forward. And it's these thumb keys on the back that you see in the front of the instrument. And her hands are just in completely the wrong place. And she's trying to blow directly into the flute rather than across the hole. That's pretty funny. Okay. This young lady has the flute the wrong way. And her hands are nowhere near in the right place. You can see. Oh, this is what's funny. When people... Um, talk about the flute, they say, oh, you play the flute? And it's very, very common that they lift both hands, sometimes to the right side, but the fingers are all facing away. And we don't do that. The The uh, right hand should be turned forward when we hold the flute. But people do this and wiggle their fingers and say, you play the flute? That's what she's doing there. She's got both hands going back and they're not in the right place uh, on the instrument. Okay, what else do we have here? Oh, this, this lady's funny. Um, she has her flute set up wrong. This interesting flute, it's a wooden or plastic instrument. It's probably wood with a metal head joint. And she has the instrument turned 
set up on the head joint so that the keys are facing straight. I think they thought it looked good in this photo, but the keys should be faced up to the ceiling. So this will be really hard on the left wrist if you were to play the flute that way. And her right hand is completely wrong on the wrong side of the flute. Okay, I think that is that my last slide. Yay, I made it to the end. Um, I think that's everything. Sorry, this is a longer video today. I'm going to try to upload this one to YouTube and give you a couple more things to look at for today. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Um, have a good day, guys. Bye.